Welcome everyone, this is Coaching in Session. My name is Michael Reardon and I will be your mindset coach today. And today we're gonna to be talking about the essence and the philosophy of fitness. Now fitness is going to be one of those things that many people don't fully understand. They have a notion of what fitness is, the bodybuilders, the nutrition aspects, the keto, the paleo, the whole 30. They think about those things. Then they think about the gyms, the Planet Fitness, the Goals gyms, the orange theories of the world, the CrossFit gyms that are popping up everywhere. And then we start to ask, well, what is fitness? Why am I not fit? Why have I fallen off of the horse because I used to do something in my life? Ask yourself, are you a person that was active once in your life? For example, you might have been a sports star playing basketball, volleyball, soccer, football in high school, but then all of a sudden, now you're an adult and your priorities are not so much on health and fitness. You are not worried about your wellness because you are already well. But most people are not going to be paying attention to their wellness until they're no longer well, until they're unwell. However, we can begin to educate ourselves. We can start to give ourselves the mindset. We can give ourselves the notion and the discipline, maybe a little bit of motivation, and that's going to help push us in the right direction. And that direction is going to be, how can we get to our best life? How can we get to the best health we have ever been in? Some people are going to have a hard time. They're going to be dealing with this, but everyone can overcome it. Everyone can shine. Everyone can win. Everyone can be healthy. And today I'm going to be bringing on a fitness coach. He's going to be helping us understand his level of fitness, but not only in the essence of lifting heavy things and putting them down, but educating people so they understand the whole concept and the totality of what fitness truly is. So let's get into that interview with Jay Curtis and myself. Welcome Jay Curtis to Coaching a Session. How are you doing today? Yeah, not too bad. Really good. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming on today. We're going to be talking about your work. You are a gym owner. You're into the health fitness world, instruction. You have some books out on strength. And we're going to be talking about all that today because health and fitness or the philosophy of fitness is something that people have a hard time or a hard concept grasping because they might think, oh, in order for me to be healthy, I have to lift a lot of weights or I have to go to the gym or I have to run on the treadmill. And some fallacies are going to stop people from going to the gym, but then there is going to be some level of truth when it comes to those things, those concepts. And we're going to be debunking all of that today. But without me telling everyone your whole biography, allow the world to know who you are and then tell them what you do. Yeah, so I'm uh, Jay Curtis or Jason Curtis. I'm also known as Coach Curtis. Originally, my fitness journey began with sort of combat sports, boxing and Thai boxing. Then I went into the military and became an infantry physical training instructor in the British Army. Did that for six years. After leaving the British Army, I went into the civilian fitness industry and became a coach, basically running boot camps and trying to build my client base. From there, I got investment to start my own gym, opened a strength conditioning gym, where for the last eight years, I've been working with both general clientele and athletes. And alongside that, I've set up an academy. So I qualify fitness professionals to be personal trainers, to be strength conditioning coaches. And that drove me also to publish a number of books. So currently, I've got about 20 books published on Amazon, which cover from anatomy and physiology through to strength training, Olympic weightlifting, how to warm up properly, injury prevention. So a whole sort of broad spectrum, which is essentially the content that I use to sort of educate other fitness professionals. Alongside that, I also or am developing a new fitness race, which I'm sort of looking to push out in 2024, known as the Deadly Dozen. So it's quite intense. But yeah, there's a, there's a number of things that I'm doing within the industry but the main focus is really education and just providing a slightly higher standard of physical training to the masses is available to everyone. That doesn't mean that you have to be an athlete. It just means that a normal person can train to a much higher standard than what they might think is possible, really. So that's it. And let's get into something you said, right, or alluded to. You said the standard of strength for health, fitness, what is your standard? And I know this is going to be subjective because my standard could be different than yours or someone else's that's listening to this. But if you can give a blanket standard for fitness, what would that be? So for me, 
what people perceive as being if I was to say fitness, most people think of like aerobic capacities. They think of their aerobic system. Can they run a certain amount of distance in a certain amount of time? So that's what people perceive as fitness. But there's actually 11 or 12 components of fitness. You know, we can break it down into strength, speed, power, muscular endurance, cardiorespiratory endurance. My standard for fitness is essentially having a good energy system. So aerobic base where you're able to partake in the activities that you want to partake in without being detrimental to your daily life so a lot of people when they hit sort of middle age and they start having kids they realize that actually I don't want to be getting out of breath when I'm chasing my kids I want to be able to do activities that maybe are a little bit more adventurous I know a lot of people get into walking or even mountaineering as they get older so it's, it's having that capacity to do that but also where people really miss out on fitness is strength what people perceive as being strength they see as bodybuilders or meatheads in the gym and see it as being a little bit of a bro science, right? We go to a gym, you lift weights, you grunt. But actually, all the literature, the science points towards you have to have the strength, as in otherwise you're going to atrophy as you get older. And it's not just your muscles that are atrophying, i.e. wasting away. It's also your bones. To maintain bone mineral density, you have to add load to the body. So as we age, we start to deteriorate in bone mass. Women can experience up to 20% loss of bone mass over during the menopausal transition. So it's a huge thing. They end up with things like osteoporosis, which is really severe, especially if you have a bad fall as you get older, you break bones, end up having problems with the hips and whatnot. In terms of my standard for fitness, it's having that base strength that you can carry out daily activities, but it's also having that standard of fitness that you're going to maintain into later life because that's you've only got one body and that's your responsibility really is to maintain your body into later life. And it's not just about physique which is where most of the fitness industry lies. It's all about body composition, how you look. It's about how your body functions in terms of being resilient, not just right now in our 20s, 30s and 40s, but when we're 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and potentially over 100 for a lot of people, you know, in this day and age. You said something great. You said maintaining and then to keep it going, right? Like maintain fitness. When I see people, when like when they're going to the gym, getting in shape, think of like New Year's resolutions or just habits in general, they might start working out, especially if they're maybe in high school, college, right? It's just a regiment that they do. And I'm sure you probably have worked with clients who might be in their 30s, 40s and said, I used to work out all the time when I was younger, but then now they don't. They didn't maintain that level of fitness or that level of discipline. Why do you think people fall out of that uh, habit of going to the gym when they do start at a younger age? This is going to be for a specific group of people because there's going to be two types generally. The people who have been working out and fall off the wagon and then the people who have never really worked out and then try to start working out later in life. What do you think about that? So I think it's, it's similar to when it comes to sport, the studies that show that a lot of kids stop enjoying it at 12 when it becomes quite competitive. And I think a lot of people that play sport through school stop when they become an adult because adulting essentially takes over. And I think what school does is provide a sort of regiment. So obviously I, what I experienced in the military was similar, that you had this regimented routine. And a lot of the blokes that I worked with struggled when they got out of the military. And I think the same applies for school, that you have this, in the UK, we have PE lessons. So it's physical education. People get into this structure and you have people that act as mentors that guide you into it. What then happens, what I see in my gym, which is probably one of the most common things I see is you get people that do a lot of sport and a lot of physical activity young. And then they hit the 20s and they sort of, because they've got that natural fitness that they've developed from being young and just being a young person, through their 20s, when they're starting to drink and they're starting to meet people that they've got interest in, they sort of lose interest in fitness as a whole. So that's grown a lot more. Especially, you know, I've seen that massively that more and more young people are wanting to strength train and build the physique. And I think that's driven by, you know, pros and cons of that, driven by social media and seeing, you know, a lot of fitness influencers. But what I tend to see is that a lot of people during the 20s just don't really care because you, you're in that shape already. You're in good shape just through maybe genetics and the fact that you're young. Through the 20s, they don't really care. They're out drinking. They're out hitting it hard. And then what I see is once they get into the 30s and they start to sort of transition into, you know, what essentially I'd call being a real adult, potentially having kids, 
is that's when they start to go, oh, actually, I'm health conscious now. I'm, I'm conscious of high blood pressure. I'm conscious of my heart. I know I experienced that. You know, I did a lot of sport and fitness when I was young. In the military, obviously, I was doing a, a massive amount of fitness. But then I slowly got into the fact of just wanting to do powerlifting and weightlifting and lifting weights. And I wasn't really conscious about cardiovascular fitness. Now I've got three kids. And obviously, we, we went through lockdown and whatnot. And, and I put a bit of weight on. I became very much health conscious in a sense of, you know what I want to be? I want my heart to be healthy. And I think that applies to a lot of people that get into fitness later is it's a little bit of realization that actually after 30, they're starting to, you know, decrease in their just their natural sort of body shape that they have. I often say it seems quite morbid, but I often say if you if you're maintaining, you're improving because you're actually getting worse. So if someone says to me, oh, I've not really improved, but I'm like, if you've maintained, you're improving because as we age, we're actually getting worse. So I think that one of the major reasons people get into fitness later is because it's the realisation you know, that they're getting older and things are getting worse. And in the 20s, they don't really care because you're 20 and everything's good. Yeah, very true. Because when if, if it ain't broke, don't fix it type of mentality, right? Those people are not going to start going to the gym until they see that they can't run with their kids or that they get a doctor's note or, you know, they get some bad news and they're like, okay, I have to start paying attention to my health. And traumas are going to be those sparks that allow people to take more action. I wish it wasn't the case, but it is the case for many people where they start doing something like, yes, as you said, they're playing sports, they're into fitness, they're doing things, their body is strong in their 20s, and then they start to fall off. But what happens when you fall off is that it's more difficult to start. Think about running a mile. If you run a full mile, it's easy. But if you stop halfway through, it's just like more difficult. And it's not more difficult because the body's having a hard time. It's more difficult because of the mind. Our mind's just like, oh, you know, this is easy. This is comfortable. And people get into that mentality. It's just comfortable. And most people don't want to sweat and struggle and huff and puff and be in misery, like be miserable and sore muscles and the whole nine, right? They don't want that. But yeah, that actually strengthens you. It strengthens you not only today, but tomorrow. Also, as you said, just helping with osteoporosis, making sure that you're stronger for the future. And I think that's going to be the best place for people. But what many people do is that they put their health on a back burner, maybe because of the stress of family, the stress of work, why should people start to look at their life as a whole today? I know we have our social media, we have our busy careers, we have two working households, a time in our world where people have a lot of uncertainty. Health and fitness are is something that you know people don't necessarily care about, even if their life is wrong. That's why you will see people, especially here in the West, allow obesity to run rampant into their life. They look in the mirror and they see it, but they don't have the energy. They don't have the will. They don't have the determination. They don't have the discipline. Instead of them doing something, they say they're beautiful just the way they are. Just to put a Band-Aid instead of going and doing the hard work. Getting into that mentality of society, what would be the remedy for people to get out of that mindset and into a mindset that's going to build strength and longevity in fitness? I think one of the things is obviously education very young. And I think we go wrong in a few places. And one of the going back to what was said about people coming back to fitness, one of the major problems I see is when I get athletes or people that are of a high standard, when they come back to fitness, they hold themselves to that standard. So I often say, you know, if you don't enjoy running, it's probably because you're running too fast, because you're holding yourself to a previous standard. And it's the same when it comes to the gym. A lot of blokes will get to the gym. They'll hold themselves to a previous standard, like I used to bench this. And then when they get to the gym, they've not got that. They can't do it. They end up injuring themselves because they're ego lifting. And actually, it demotivates them. And I think the same applies when it comes to people that into fitness or don't see the benefit. The problem is, is in the school system, because it's very much based, I know in the UK, it's very much based around sport and not always gym training is it's not always approached. I don't understand why, because you don't have the manpower or necessarily the education in the teachers and the, the strength conditioning coaches or the sports coaches. But sometimes people develop a bad relationship with fitness from a young age. 
And I think there needs to be more effort to put towards, right, let's identify the differences between people. Like not everyone's going to enjoy running cross country. So what we might actually do is create a load of people that have a real bad relationship with cross country. However, if we introduce them through different forms of fitness, which I know I've done in my gym where I've got young boys and girls that may be a little bit heavier, they've started to get into strength training. That's then built their resilience up. It's built their confidence in physical training. And then they've been more open to go and do running, but it's approached in the right way. And we definitely don't want to necessarily handhold people. It's not saying, oh, you don't have to do cross country because you don't like it. But it's, it's making sure that you've got different avenues where you're encouraging people to lift weights and making sure that, say, some women know that you don't have to lift like this. However, we do want progressive overload. We do want you to lift heavy. When you lift heavy, you're not going to grow bigger muscles. You haven't got the testosterone levels for that. It's a complete fallacy that you're going to get too big. If you were to get too big, then you've got the best genetics in the world and you probably should be a bodybuilder. It's just not going to happen. Arnold Schwarzenegger used to say that, people used to say to him, I don't want to look like you. And he says, don't worry, you never will. And it's true. People worry about gaining too much muscle. So it's key to educate these people that when you lift heavy weights, you will feel good. It will empower you. But it has to be coached in the right way. So these individuals, although I completely agree, I think it's got a little bit too soft. And I don't think handholding helps. I think it actually creates more of a victim where it reinforces their problem. And they go, well, actually, yeah, you're a victim. And it's like, no, no, you need to progressively overload. So you need to make things progressively harder. Just like in the gym, you condition yourself to a stress. It's the same mentally. You know, you gradually expose yourself to more social interactions, for example, if you feel anxious about going to a party. And I think what's missing, though, is the right coaching where you, you take these individuals and you mentor them and you make sure that they know that that gym full of meatheads, most of them are actually quite lovely blokes. They just really enjoy lifting heavy weights. And to sort of see them as bad people is actually quite sort of bigoted in a sense. But people like to do that. So I think it's key that with these individuals, we just take the right approach not hand-holding, but introducing different forms of physical training in the right way. That's not just necessarily throwing them into, you know, the standard schoolyard fitness that not everyone does enjoy. Like, for example, a lot of young girls are not competitive, so they don't like sport. However, they really enjoy circuit training. They really enjoy going to the gym, but they're just not competitive people. So you've got to think, right, well, how can we stimulate them in different ways? Yeah, no, that's important because if we know that someone is not competitive and if they are more in the mindset of just trying to be in the best shape possible, we can give them different avenues. For example, even if they ran a 5K, right? You know, like I like I know you're doing a race right now, but let's just say they're just doing a typical 5K. They can say that I'm just trying to do a 5K to challenge myself instead of saying I'm trying to be number one, right? You're still in that same 5K with the 100 or 200 people doing that same race. It's just that you have a different approach to it. And when people approach fitness, especially strength training, when they go into the gym for the first time, the self-conscious is like, they're so aware to like what they do. If they're doing something wrong, or if they're looking around, they see someone bigger than them. They're like, okay, like, you know, like I'll never be like that. So this, you know, self-doubt limiting beliefs come in. But even there, it's just like, they have a fear to ask for help. I think that's a big issue because people are afraid to ask for help when they need help. As you said, there is an issue in education. Here in America, we have PE for about 45 minutes once a week. Yes, the kids get to go out and they get to go play on the playground for about 30 minutes, maybe 40 minutes sometimes. And high school is even worse. You have PE, I think... You have to have two classes of PE only. That's only like a semester. And then the rest of the, you know three and a half years, you don't have to have any activity. Yes, you can do sports. You can do basketball, soccer, like all the time. But it seems like fitness is something that is not pronounced. And the education of fitness has been deteriorating over the years. Because even when I went to high school, we had personal wellness where it was a class that was, you know, like one quarter, you would do the class after you learned a little bit about nutrition, a little bit about dying, a little bit about fitness. But I can tell you after that class, I wasn't equipped to start working out and being in shape. P 
people lack the education. People lack the awareness of what their body needs. It's like they are perfect when they're born, almost perfect. They are just in a really good place and they don't understand that their body is going to be their greatest asset in life, right? That education. How can we start to apply education and have a greater impact in it so we can like make people more aware? Do we have to implement more schools? Do we have to have more gyms? like yours? Do we have to do more programs that are going to be free for people so they can attend online seminars? Like what needs to be done to educate people on the philosophy of fitness? See, I think first things first, it's obviously needs to start at home. So it's the parents initially that, you know, I see the members of my gym because I do think independent gyms are a key because you're getting very specialized, very passionate individuals that are starting their gyms. And then in independent gyms, the focus are the clients, you know, massively, each and every individual. I know every one of my clients by my f- the first and last name. And I know from seeing the parents that I have in the gym, by nature, they're more likely to be active because they've joined, you know, a strength and conditioning gym. It's a little bit more higher level than what you'd find in a commercial gym setting. And these people are doing the park runs, which is all the parks across the UK. They have a 5K every Saturday or Sunday that's like volunteer led. These individuals take the kids to the park room. It's seen as a family activity. So it's ingrained from being young. I know when I was young, my mum and dad, probably because it was a cheap thing to do, we went walking most of the time, you know, rather than going, we did go to soft plays and stuff, but it was it was walking all the time. So that was ingrained to just walk, 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 get up the hills, get your legs stronger. So it definitely has to come from the parents initially to develop that healthy relationship with fitness. From there, one of the easiest ways to do it, because I understand that the education system is stretched and it isn't easy to have teachers that have the level of knowledge to apply proper physical education. I do think there needs to be a shift where you have the sports side of physical education, then you have the fitness side, which is purely just how can you keep your body happy and healthy in terms of whether it's yoga, Pilates, you know, running, walking, and you know, like as in seeing walking as a and more of a fitness activity than just getting from A to B. So there's that whole education in all the different ways that you can become fit, whether it be swimming, and teaching this in a way that it's, it's a leisure activity. It's something that's going to make you feel better. In my school, we actually had a boxing program, which was an anti-bullying program. And it was the most successful anti-bullying scheme in, in the northwest of England. And people said, well, I understand you're taking people that are getting bullied and teaching them to box. It'll raise their confidence. But you're also taking on bullies, which is what we did. So all the bullies would come as well. People that had been reported for bullying comes to the boxing. And everyone that was involved in the boxing stopped bullying because basically it teaches them that level of respect. So having these sort of programs in school that are teaching sport and physical education for the leisure of getting fit and how beneficial it is, is good. And I think the way that you can mechanize that is there's more and more gyms. I know, especially in the UK, I've experienced it. I'm sure it's the same in the States. There's more and more independent gyms. You're getting CrossFit boxes. You're getting individuals setting up these personal training studios. Now, the majority of these people are very experienced. They're very qualified and they're very passionate. And the majority of these people would be more than happy to sort of self-promote by going into schools, running volunteer sort of workshops on what they do, whether it be yoga, whether it be Pilates, whether it be running coaching, whether it be anything. You know, all the coaches that I know and I work with and mentor and I've qualified If I said I've got five schools that are all looking for a morning where a volunteer is going to come in and they're going to teach the kids how to squat, how to lunge, how to do a press up, how to do a sit up. And they're going to teach them how to do a circuit training class. Every single one of them would do it. And I think if every town sort of mechanized that where they took the fitness community and brought them into schools and set whatever days it may be, whether they're doing sports days and stuff, they just mechanize these individuals because these individuals are wanting to network. Because at the end of the day, if I go into a school and I teach a circuit training session or it's an open day with parents, the chances that I'm going to get clients coming to me as in parents going, oh, can you train my child or can you train me? It's huge. So it's every PT's dream to sort of be getting out there because it's going to make their business more successful. And when it comes to the fitness industry, it's incredibly hard to be successful. It's a really hard industry to conquer. I think the majority of PTs would be more than happy to do that, not just on a self-serving level, but also it's a good thing to do, getting into schools. You know, I've volunteered at dozens of schools, whether they be from, you know, special educational needs, 
right across the board because you just feel good for doing it. Most people are more than happy to do stuff like that. So I think that needs to be mechanized because in my town alone, when it's not a huge town where I live, there is dozens of independent gyms and more personal trainers and coaches than you, than you can count. And they, they should be mechanized, really. Yeah, I know. That's actually a, a really good idea. Personal trainers to volunteer, go into schools and start to implement an education fitness at an early age. It is something that I don't know if people do over here in the States. I know when I was a teacher, we didn't have much of it where, like I said, we just had the PE class and the arts and stuff like that. And that was the education that you got for fitness or, you know, like moving around and stuff like that. But it was really based on testing, right? Just like test you, test you, test you until like you can't be tested anymore. So testing is is very heavy in our school system currently. But I think if we can switch over to a focus of volunteer teachers coming in, trainers coming in, educating them, and not just on, on fitness, right? It, it could be on any aspect of healing, right? A doctor comes in, spends a little bit of time with the school, gives a 30 minute workshop on nutrition or, you know, something along those lines. And that can just create the seed, right? Just put the seed into them. So then now they're more health conscious because I don't know if you've seen our grocery stores, it is full of processed foods. Kids love eating those processed foods. So they create that habit. And when they're young at an early age, it doesn't necessarily impact them because their body is just so like effective and efficient where it can move things pretty quickly. Now we do have a, a problem now. Children today are less active. Before we would go out, ride our bike, play on the playground. But now we have our Game Boys and our uh, Playstations and our Xboxes and our computers. And it's stopping a lot of movement that was natural for kids. They're starting to see you know, obesity at younger ages or kids starting to pack on weight at younger ages, because even though their body is efficient and effective, they are just not moving as much as they used to. Genetics are not going to just happen overnight. So it's going to be something that they have to build into. But I wanted to get into a conversation of nutrition. What would be an effective way for people to implement some level of, of understanding of nutrition into the life? Would it be some type of online, if you have a book or something on that, where people can go to so they can learn basic nutrition? We actually have a partner, so my academy partner with someone called BTN, which is a nutrition academy. And we have quite a lot of content. So what my Instagram does, so my Instagram's got an, quite an all right follow, and it's, we've got over 100,000 followers on the Instagram. And that's just been built because we give away free eBooks. So what I do is I produce free ebooks. So it might be a 10 or 20 page PDF. When I post it, you comment on the post and you get the free ebook. And that's something I do, obviously, to collect. You know, it obviously benefits me. I collect emails. People become interested in what I do. And hopefully it upsells to courses. But it also means that I've literally given away over, I think it's 300 ebooks so far on different things from strength training to nutrition. We definitely concentrate on having a very sort of pragmatic view on nutrition and that's my viewpoint where the problem is with nutrition more so than training is that training although someone might go kettlebells are better barbells are better or i i prefer long duration cardio or i prefer hit training nutrition is even more nuanced where you get people completely on other ends of the spectrum where people say you know eating meat is bad for you other people say eating vegetables is bad for you and vice versa in, in different ways it's very very complicated However, the people that we've partnered with focus solely on it's all evidence-based. It's about being realistic, so it's not dogmatic. For me, whenever someone's dogmatic about a certain opinion or very sort of broad brush, like you can't have carbs, proteins or fats, it's a no-go for me. It's just not realistic. It's As long as they sort of explain that, yes, there are these restriction diets and what they do is they restrict a specific aspect of your diet, they create a deficit and that's why you're losing weight. It's been very transparent, but it's fundamentally understanding that the building blocks of nutrition, i.e. the macronutrients, you've got your proteins, your fats and your carbs, pushing that you want to get things from whole foods, you want a good, varied, balanced diet. So balance is ultimately the key, but it's very hard to find sources online, I think, that are not sort of biased in one way. 
Um, so a lot of the time, that's why, although some of the sort of health websites can be a little bit outdated, which they definitely can in the UK, is I would sort of steer people towards their more sort of generic websites. Like in the UK, you have got the NHS and stuff like that. And you've got the industries that concentrate on, you know, just the science of food. It's very much straight down the line. Because if you start following influencers that push nutrition, it's amazing how much misinformation there is. So I would definitely get a sort of overall knowledge of nutrition first, where you've got that information that's quite obvious to, to me or you, but you'd be surprised how many people don't know that. So it's key to get the overview before you start delving into the sort of specifics of nutrition, because it becomes a little bit of a minefield quite quickly. Yeah, definitely. Because people are going to be your diehard warriors. They're going to say, I'm keto, I'm paleo. I'm carnivore. They will say that this works for them. They might attest to it. They might have the results for it. But what I can say is that everyone's body is different and everybody is going to be changing around 28, 30, around there. Your body just changes, right? Just because you can maybe have some intolerances that you might not have realized. You could be allergic to certain foods. I, I know I can't tell you how many people are allergic to certain foods that they can eat and tolerate, but it causes inflammation. There's a book called, I, I believe it's called the inflammation spectrum or, or, or something along those lines. It talks all about that. And so you do have to figure out what foods work best for you. That's why working with a coach, a trainer, a nutritionist is essential because yes, you can do it by yourself. We watch some videos on YouTube and you can maybe get there but you are just going to be burning yourself out. It's just like spinning the wheels, spinning the wheels. When you can have someone saying, hey, I see where you are. Let's you know, do this, right? That's going to help push you so much more. And then if you just have that mindset of not wanting to strength train because you think you're going to be bulked up, then that, again, get a trainer, right? They're going to say, no, that's not true. So we have a lot of misinformation a lot of things that don't help us when it comes to health and our fitness. But if you can find someone like Jay, you're going to see that there is an alternative to how you're currently thinking, right? And typically that's going to be into a better health and a better life. Before we go, Jay, I would love for you to share with us some last words and then to please tell the audience where they can find you. Basically, I've, I'd just like to say that when it comes to physical training, is I think sort of Nike's hit the nail on the head, which is just do it, is often the biggest barrier to entry is just that getting through the door or starting. And the problem people have is that they'll go, I'll start Monday or start in the new year. And the best way to do it is just do it. Get started right away. Don't be intimidated by it because everyone starts somewhere. And the key to physical training is purely and simply this. There's no magic rep or set range. In fact, you want to undulate it. Sometimes you might do five sets of one rep. Sometimes you might do three sets of 20 reps. There's no magical set of rep range. Nothing's perfect. No perfect program. All of it works. It's more about what's enjoyable for you, what's going to be sustainable, what's going to allow you to be consistent. But what the fundamental of programming is, is progressive overload. So training needs to get progressively harder. However, it can't just get progressively hard forever. You have periods where you pull back you have sessions that aren't as hard as other sessions but fundamentally you want to start at a moderate intensity if you're really not enjoying the exercise you're probably going a little bit too hard do something a little bit different however make it progressively hard because what used to be hard will soon become easy and you'll just make it harder and harder and harder as you build your conditioning up when it comes to injuries more often than not you've just done a little bit too much a little bit too soon yeah, as in you've had a spike in intensity or a spike in volume or frequency and your tendons or your muscles just can't quite accommodate that stress right now. You have a little bit of rest and the body heals itself. Yeah, a lot of the time you don't have to spend a fortune on all these sort of remedies and, and, and people to, to look at it. Obviously, if you're unsure, have someone look at it, a medical professional, but more often than not, your body's going to heal itself. So all these niggles and injuries, a lot of the time, they're nothing to worry about. It's a small strain. It's a little bit of overuse. With a little bit of a rest or modification of the exercise that you're doing, you're absolutely fine. So it's just about building up progressively and, and just do it. Just get straight into it because you're never going to be as young as you are today. So that would be my advice. Just, just get to it. 
I'm on Instagram, which is Strength and Conditioning Course. So it's quite a long name. So it's Coach Jason Curtis, but my, my name is Strength and Conditioning Course. We give out free content three times a week, and that includes everything from anatomy and physiology to strength training to nutrition. And some of the ebooks are up to free, 300 pages long, and you download them for free. I've also got a website, which is my personal website, which is just jasoncurtis.org. And you can find all my books and links to my other websites, such as my course website, my gym website, and my, my fitness race website. And that's everything. And I'll definitely make it easy for the listeners and the viewers to get to that information, the eBooks, the website, the books, put it by putting all of that in the description box below. I encourage everyone to check it out because health and fitness and wellness overall is going to be your greatest asset in life. Yes, I know a lot of people focus on money. Some people focus on time, but not enough people focus on their body. What you do, Jason or Jay, is going to be helping the world get into a better mindset when it comes to fitness. And I want to thank you so much for spending a little bit of time with us today, sharing your knowledge and your wisdom and just doing the work that you do. Thank you. I really appreciate you having me on. All right, everyone. I'd like to thank you so much for watching that interview with Jay Curtis and myself. What went on in that interview is that we were talking about the idea of fitness and not so much of how to be fit, going to the gym, lifting some weights and things like that but truly on education. And here in Coaching A Session, we want to provide you with as much education as possible because when you can allow education in your life, you're going to be building knowledge. But then you also have to focus on the aspect of wisdom. Wisdom is doing. Wisdom is truly understanding, is comprehending what is going on. And then when we look at the notion of now we have this education, what do we do with it? Some people are going to go to a four-year college. They're going to get their education and they get their education, right? They're super good maybe, but then all of a sudden, they don't want to do their major anymore. They don't have a passion in it. They're not in love like they used to be. And sometimes that can happen with your health and your fitness and going into the gym. You might find that you don't like going to the gym. You might find that it's too much work. But if you find that it is not enjoyable, it just means you have not found what you truly are looking for. Maybe it's CrossFit. Maybe it's running marathons. Maybe it's powerlifting. Maybe it's doing Zumba or some boxing. Something, right? You can find a love for fitness. Some people can find it very easily. Some people have a hard time because they're going to be dealing with a lot of health issues. They're going to be dealing with a lot of stress in the world. And I will tell you, I understand that the world is full of stress. I understand that you have a lot of problems. But when you go to the gym, you actually get more energy and you actually get rid of stress. So most people don't want to go to the gym because they have no energy and they have a lot of stress in their life. But going to the gym is going to alleviate the stress and give you more energy. And I know people think that, you know, going to the gym, you need energy. If they don't have going to the gym. They can't go. But when you go to the gym, something magic happens. You start to see people. You are immersed in that environment and you start to make some changes, not only physically, but mentally. You start to maybe make some friends, associates, and then you grow. Then you learn and then you prosper. And it began with your health because our health is going to be one of the most important things that we have in our whole entire life. We only get one body. Yes, we can go for a surgery. We can get bigger boobs or a bigger butt, whatever. But you can put in the work and you can get the same results. I know some people are looking for the quick fix. They gain a bunch of weight. Oh, I got to go for gastric bypass surgery or whatever. They look for the quick fix. But something magical happens when you say, I'm going to learn. I'm going to educate. I'm going to put in the work. Then things start to fall into place. It's not going to be easy. I'm not here to say that life is supposed to be easy. I'm not here to say that, that everything's going to be rainbows and gumdrops and fairy tales because you want it to be. It's going to require a challenge. It's going to require you to struggle and grow every single day. And it's going to suck. It's not going to feel good some days. But the fact that you did it, the fact that you grew, is going to show your mind that this is not the end. The end is when you give up. 
As long as you don't give up on your discipline, your health, and your fitness, the idea of education, we are supposed to learn every single day. And as long as you can learn, you are going to find that you can be better in every aspect of your life. Check out all the links in the description box below, whether it's Jay or myself here at Reverend Concepts. We are here to make sure that you are going to be in the best place possible. My name is Michael Reardon. I'm a mindset coach. If you have any questions, you can email me coaching at session at gmail.com. And I'll see everyone on the next episode of Coaching in Session. Until then, everyone take care.